Hi, it's Kim West, the Sleep Lady, and welcome to the Gentle Parenting Show. And on this episode, I am so excited to have McCall Gordon. She is one of my certified gentle sleep coaches for over five years. And the first time we met, we just hit it off. <laughs> we couldn't stop talking. <laughs> um, we really very like-minded. We both also had kind of one of these alert or live wired children. And McCall has a passion and a love for research and sleep and temperament and sleep. And you're also a, you have your, your master's in applied psychology, and you also teach at a university and research yep. and, and, and also help families yep. uh, get their babies to sleep. So thank you so much for having, having uh, come on to the show. Oh, I'm thrilled. Love it. So we're going to have McCall on again, because I want to also talk about just about temperament and sleep. But today I want to talk about the research that you've done, McCall, on the sort of literature review about infant sleep and sleep training, because it's so confusing. You know, when I put together um, a comparison list of all the books, especially zero to six months, like I'm, I'm confused okay. as a new parent about yeah. what to do, when to do it, yeah. how to do it, when it's okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this passion for you and yeah. what you've discovered. Perfect. Well, I started this um, way back in the what feels like the dark ages now, when before the internet, uh, when we just had those parenting magazines, right, in the pediatricians' offices and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. and I remember back then, so this was the, you know, like 1994 ish. And it was the era of that critical period of brain development. So like everything was about brain development and they, these magazines would talk about how important responsiveness was to brain development. It's really important to respond to your baby's cues, all that stuff. And I was like, that's great. And like literally the next page it would be, and for sleep, you have to let them cry it out. And I was like, that doesn't totally... Okay. And that age for crying it out started getting younger and younger and younger till it was like four months. And I thought, mm. you know, that something about this isn't making sense, but I'm sure they've researched it. I'm sure it's fine. Cause I'm just a mom. What do I know? Right. It doesn't right. sound right. And so, um, as the years went on, I kept sort of asking this question and, um, ultimately decided to go to graduate school and actually pursue this question. Like, what do we know? about using a lot of crying at, you know, younger ages. Mm -hmm. um, so it was specifically under six months, but also just kind of in the mm -hmm. first year in general. Um, mm -hmm. And it was fascinating because the more I looked, the less I found. And that was uh, 20 years ago, almost 20. Uh, and guess what? Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. the, the paper that I wrote almost 20 years ago, still, mm -hmm. uh, still is fine. And I am just going to add on some more. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I know. What it's about this? Shocking. I remember I had a one colleague who's a pediatrician who said, Oh, well, we're so relieved as pediatricians that there was this research article that graduated extinction in the U S a la fervor, um, does not do emotional damage. So now just everybody go for it. Oh God. How long, What's do we that have? How, about? how long do we have now? Okay. So, <laughs> so there's there. So, so the, my original interest in like, how does the research compare to the advice is kind of wh what I do. Right. So mm -hmm. I look at what parents are being told by pediatricians, mm -hmm. by books, somewhat on the internet, and then compare that. Okay. When they reference research like that, what are they really saying? And there was, yes, there was a study that went five years down the road and said, we did, um, they did some stuff like the child behavior checklist. They did a very strange assessment of something like, almost like uh, it was a style of attachment that I'd never even heard of. I had to look it up. It was basically the worst kind of attachment. And to say, hey, none of these kids have this really bad kind of attachment. Um, mm -hmm. the, the assessment of, negative effects, I always say is like looking for something you don't really want to find. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. either they don't do so in research, you want to find a difference, right? So you mm -hmm. often have to do a baseline, 
And then you have to do another measure and say, did this change? The attachment right. research never did a baseline. So we don't mm -hmm. know. We don't know if it changed. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the assessments are pretty global, like they're pretty giant. And I totally wouldn't expect five years out for us to see some kind of dramatic difference. The point no. is the research is interpreted to say that crying it out never hurts anyone under any circumstances. And I think that's where the mistake is. So for most children, mellower, you know, kind of kids that might cry for three nights and it's all over, you know, I can't argue with that. There are right. some children who are crying intense amounts for many, many nights. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how you can compare those two, but the research does not. Remember, research is about averages, right? Yeah. They're about averages. So they'll yeah. say extinction works, extinction works. But when you start looking at it, it only, it works for between 50 and 70% of that sample. That means there's like 30% that it did not work for. And like, I always say, who are those kids? <laughs> right? Right. And so then are the samples like all over the board with the age of the children too? Oh God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for, I mean, you'd think of research being scientific and that there's some mm -hmm. like specificity and some precision and sometimes, especially with age, there isn't. So, um, mm -hmm. the stud, some of the studies that get cited as being, you know, this is effective, will say it was effective for infants. And you look at the sample, one of them, the sample was four months to 52 months. That's a wow. four and a half year old. Right. That's so, and infant. they don't say, they don't say how many little babies they had in the sample. There might only have been one. Um, wow. And we don't know how that one baby did. It's just right. this global, like across all these children, mm -hmm. it was all fine or it really worked. Mm -hmm. Um, and that happens a ton. That's, that's pretty common. So they'll just yeah. say, oh, babies. Or they'll use the research uh, to say extinction or crying it out is fine. It's fine. And then you look at the research and almost none of it was done on, on actual babies. They were toddlers and preschoolers. So yeah. um, the research really doesn't take a developmental stance on like, well, let's really slice and dice this and say, you know, how did little babies do? How did these babies do? How do those? And who doesn't it work for? Like really giving parents an option, right? Like, hey, if your baby is this way, maybe this isn't the, the, the approach for you. Maybe yeah. it's not going to, it might not work as well for you. Yeah. Right? I mean, I always like to, to, to tell parents and my coaches that, you know, if you've been doing something and the family's been consistent and you see no change, honestly, in three nights, I might even go less in some cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, you need to stop. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. And for sure by five, the idea is not you keep going, you know, yeah. and hope and pray that it, it will work. And right. I do, I remember I had one coach who had worked with a family who their coach had told them to do extinction and right. they did it with their baby was 11 months old and they did it for yeah. three weeks and the baby um, stopped smiling and oh, stopped God. having eye contact with the parents. Oh, God. And, you know, and then of course they were being told, oh, the research says, and I'm like, it's but fine. we have to look at the child, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we also have to remember that um, a vast majority of the assessment of negative outcome, in fact, there's one like big seminal study showing no emotional impact. Mm -hmm. um, they used, number one, they used a scale that was bonkers. Um, mm -hmm. It was made in 1974 to assess a very early kind of early concept of attachment. It was called mm -hmm. security. But these mm -hmm. items are like, uh, security is shown like if a parent says, uh, they have to check off questions, it says like, baby enjoys rough play. Baby allows a, a, an unknown person to feed them. Uh, doesn't protest diaper changes. Like, Mm -hmm. How does that demonstrate security? That's, those mm -hmm. are like temperament or an age and like, mm -hmm. anyway, so that study has been used to, to say there's no emotional impacts. Um, but, but those things are filled out by parents. 
Mm-hmm. So there's a couple of problems with only having parent report. Number one, if the baby wasn't sleeping and now the baby is, you, it, you're immediately going to think the, it's a whole new world, right? <laughs> like, right. My baby's perfect now yep. because I'm sleeping, um, right. number one. And number two, you can't ask a parent who just did something, hey, do you think that affected your child's emotional well-being? I mean, what right. do you think a parent's going to say, right? Right. So we really need objective measurements of this baby's um, behavior um, so that we really can understand it a little bit better. More not to say that crying it out is bad. It really isn't. I I have to always emphasize that. Like I am not saying crying it out is trauma, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm also not saying it's never trauma. Right. Right. So that's, that's the implied thing. Um, and you're hundred percent right. The parents mm-hmm. keep going because I'll tell you, um, you know, all that research is based on behaviorism and behaviorism, John Watson, right. The guy in the twenties said that babies come into the world as a blank slate. And the only thing they learn is from the environment. Right. So crying it out is based on this idea that w- how you respond to that baby will just train that baby to do something. And that if it doesn't work, it's the mm-hmm. environment's fault, meaning the parents. Right. So even in the studies, the studies would say, well, it didn't work for 50% of the children, but, but there were, we believe there were problems with parent compliance. Right. So even the studies blame the parents if it didn't really work. They don't blame the intervention. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, I keep, every time I talk about this, I'm like, it's nuts. It's really nuts. And you do see that. I mean, and I do talk about like the secret sauce to sleep coaching success is consistency. Sure. And, but it's not just consistency. Right. Right. You know, it's everything, the dia, the dynamic between parent and child and what's going on emotionally for the parent and the child's temperament and everything, you know, timing, environment, age. Yeah. So then, so McCall, so if you were saying that, or you're saying that, you know, maybe we we can't just take one thing and make a blanket assumption about all children. Tell me if I'm hearing any of this incorrectly. Yeah. And that I think, what did you say then? 30 to 50% of children it won't work with? That well, it, in the research, it, yeah, about, the research. about that, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So then, so tell, like, for, well, I mean, there's so many questions to ask about this. So yeah, what I know. about age? How about this big argument about, yeah. like, when can I start sleep right. training? Yeah. You know, regardless of whether I do yeah. extinction, graduated extinction, my method, you know, parental fading, right. shuffle. What, what do you right. think about that? Right, right, right. That's a good, a really good question. So, and is um, there any very, research or, to support anything about yeah. when to start? <laughs> Short answer no. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, so, that's a really big, big topic. Um, almost all the research, at least on extinction, has been traditionally on babies six months and up. Uh, my first research, I think I found four studies that used any infants under six months Mm -hmm. and, but those were part of a much bigger sample, right? So there were none on just babies under this age, even the big staunch extinction researcher, Karen France says Mm -hmm. you should not use extinction in babies under six months and maybe nine months is even better. Like she knew. She knew, and she's the biggie. And she's would she include kid. graduated extinction, fervor, yeah. checks? Yeah, okay. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so then there have been people who say, well, there's a whole uh, bunch of people that are like, well, maybe prevention is better. So maybe starting skills, like even from birth. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, starting skills, when you read these studies, they're talking minute delays, minute mm-hmm. delays, or sometimes they don't even tell you what they're actually saying. They'll say parents were taught about appropriate responding to night waking, and they don't say what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the stuff that used any delays, they're tiny short, like one to two, maybe a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, and much of that research, the prevention research didn't stick. Like by you know, a follow-up a few months later, the intervention babies weren't actually doing any better. Mm -hmm. So there's a big function of just development that happens, Mm -hmm. you know, as you know, like 
Right. Those babies might have done better no matter what you did. Right. Um, there's also no research that says you have to start early. There's no research that says it's better to start early than start later, which I think is absolutely the big takeaway. Um, yeah. There's no advantage to starting early. And as like you, from your information too, your work, it might be way harder to start during that silly four month regression. Yeah. Like that's kind of the worst time to start. I yeah. don't know where they got that number. I yeah. really don't. Well, and I, um, you know, yeah. I, I always am so pained to hear parents say, well, get ready. You're going to have to, you know, sleep train multiple times in your child's life. And I was like, right. well, let's hope not. I mean, that's yeah. never been, that's not what I've seen in my 25 yeah. years, you know? Yeah. I mean, however, I do sometimes wonder if it's when a parent did some form of sleep training early on. And yeah. I'm not even sure the child learned a skill because they wouldn't right. even like put their hands or their mouth or roll right. or do right. anything to self-regulate. And then right. maybe they have to be sleep coached later on. Right, um, right, right. That makes sense. I mean, it sometimes happens like after a vacation or somebody gets sick, sure. you know, when they, when you have to backslide, you have to do it again. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the thing about you know, we, the, the advice and stuff has to like talk parents into, there's all this talking parents into withstanding the crying. Yeah. And I'm always like, if we have to work that hard to talk somebody into something, maybe this isn't quite, maybe this isn't quite right. You right. know, why do we have to talk parents into mm -hmm. doing it? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, for a lot of parents, it's going to be, you know, maybe a no brainer, but, or easy, or it fits their style mm -hmm. and it's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have, there's that big pediatric practice that's telling parents of two month olds to put that baby in the bed, close the door and not go in till morning. And there is a, there is no science on, on that, on the advisability of doing that. So there's a lot out there that people are just kind of saying, mm -hmm. or they're using research in kind of a slapdash way. Um, and when you really, really start looking at the nuts and bolts of that research, like I have, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a little like emperor's new clothes, you know, like the more you look, the less that's there. Um, for example, let's just think too about research and what they mean by effective. I mean, that's a really important topic mm. when they say, oh, extinction is effective. It's like, okay, well, let's think, what does that mean? Okay. Sleep clearly improved. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. But remember that research is looking for statistical significance, not actual significance. Mm. So, mm. so they might say the intervention group had significant improvements in sleep. You look at the actual chart of the data and you go, wait a minute, the intervention group only slept 15 minutes longer at night. Right. After all, after a whole battery of extinction, the intervent, the parents of the intervention babies were getting 15 minutes more sleep after all that work. Wow. And I think if you told parents that like, Hey, you could do this and get, you know, parents are thinking through the night, no waking. Right. And that is not what the research does at all. In fact, almost all the times babies are still waking at the end of the study. Right. So there's a real big wow. disconnect about what parents expect to happen and what the research actually found and reported. I mean, maybe you can't answer this, but because it, it's too broad of a question, but if the babies are still waking, is it because the expectation was inappropriate for, let's say, the age of the child or the intervention wasn't done yeah. properly? Or I don't know. Huh. I don't know. I mean, I think there have been, there have been a couple of studies that look at the real world application of like graduated extinction. And both of them say, uh, oh, that's, this is another piece we should talk about. But both of them say parents in the real world are, are not having the same level of success they found in lab experiment settings. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. And this is great information for, you know, yeah. <laughs> about coaches. Uh, I would say 99% of studies on crying it out are done within what I would call a coaching context. Mm -hmm. So they'll say parents were parents met with a clinician and had this full workup done. They um, had a consultation with the clinician uh, to craft this plan. 
Then they had follow-ups from researchers every day to answer questions. Right. And, the, and the control group got a pamphlet. Right. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> the control group didn't get any of that evaluation and support right. that the intervention families got. So was it the intervention or was it all that support that actually made the difference? So parents are taking, you know, this book home and trying to do this on their own with the best tools they have. Yeah. And that's a much different, it's a totally different world than Absolutely. how they researched it. I mean, I even yeah. just think over my years of coaching, you know, the parent, you know, all the parents love their children and yeah. were smart and, you know, had their own accomplishments in life. But, you know, right. when you're sleep deprived and in the thick of it, right, you can't yeah. see clearly, you know, and, well, and they would yeah. say, Kim, you know, it mattered when you called in the morning. I felt like yeah. I had to answer to you, not that I was going to criticize them yeah. or anything, right? No, but, but they knew that someone was going to ask them what happened, how did it go, and that someone yeah. was going to be there to support them, to strategize right. with them. They would just say, right. I, "I'm Kim. I I got your book. I'm too tired to read it. I just need you to yeah. tell me what to do and help yeah, support yeah, yeah. me through this. Or maybe I've tried and right. failed before." And I don't, right. I'm all alone, you know, I'm isolated, yeah, yeah. my partner's deployed, you know, I really, yeah, it well, makes yeah. such a difference. It's a pandemic. <laughs> exactly. It really makes such a big difference. That, yeah. You know. Well, and, and a lot of times it's telling, being able to tell parents what they're doing right. Yeah. Because so many of them, I'm telling you, I think the amount of advice that's out there makes parents feel like they're walking a, a, among landmines. Like if I make one false move, I've ruined my child's life. Yeah. And you're like, you know, it, it really isn't like that with sleep. Yeah. It really isn't like that. You can decide what's a problem. You can decide when to intervene. If it's working right now, it's working right now. It's fine. You know, the advice um, I think is so confusing um, that parents are, and they've, and they've raised the stakes on sleep because there's all that research that says babies who don't sleep are more likely to be obese, have ADHD, have behavioral problems. Parents are like quivering yeah. because they're so stressed out. Yeah. Um, and then they do what, what you were saying is they run, they go, okay, I'm going to try this. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. I'm going to try this. Okay. That doesn't, and then, you know, and then you're just like, yeah. it's a mess. Right. Um, and so I think the advice, I wish the advice would be would give parents options about what would work. For, you know, here are a bunch of options. Choose what works for your kid. And like you said, consistency is it. Pick something you can do and just do that. Right. Right. It's not magic. Right. I often I wondered whether the timing of when a society or culture says it's okay to sleep coach is related to maternity leaves. Um, you know, because oh, in yeah. Canada, for instance, uh, you know, they have usually a year. And so I, I used to get lots of calls at 10, usually 11 and a half months old <laughs> and they're going back to work. Um, and then a few years ago when I was te uh, talking at a conference in Moscow, um, we did a little survey, my coach there, um, to her very large, uh, following and asked, you know, when did you, when were you told by, as an example, your doctor that your child should yeah. be sleeping through the night? And on average, it was like three years old, two to three years old. Wow. And, wow. um, and then when I asked them like, well, how long is the maternity? And it's much longer. It can be up to three yeah. years in Russia. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, yeah. you know, if you don't have any pressure and then you look at America where we either have no yeah. paid maternity leave, most places, or if right. you're lucky three months. And so I think that right. factors into it. There's no, I haven't done oh, any totally research do. on it. I just feel like yeah. people, parents feel no, so pressured, I think that's true. you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I don't blame them either. I mean, right now, even worse, you know, I do have people going back to work. Um, you know, the baby's not sleeping. Yeah. Um, it, it, for sure. I think that's a hundred percent. And I bet you, I bet you could do, I bet we could just go, you know, country by country and see like, okay, your maternity leave is right. this, this long. What, 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 I think that's genius. Yeah. I bet it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's super hard. I mean, but the thing is, is I, 
you know, as you know, we catch so much stuff that the, that the advice on sleep training doesn't give people an out. They say a baby should be sleeping through the night by three months, around three months. They, they should, should be, um, sleeping eight hours. And I, I, that's just a super high bar for yeah. parents. Like, yes, there are babies who are going to sleep, but those babies, you could stand on their on your head and they would be good sleepers. Mm-hmm. Um, most parents, that's a really high bar for them to set. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I mean, you know, we we see people all the time who are like, my baby's waking up every hour, yeah. and you're like, okay, there's normal waking, and then there's that. Let's figure out what's going on. And we we found we find all kinds of stuff that is not in the sleep advice. Like, I don't think sleep advice ever says, Hey, if X, Y, or Z is happening with around sleep, you should get this other thing checked out. Right. Right? It's just like, Nope, full steam ahead with, with behavioral. Yeah. And not look at, right. I mean, we're not even talking about reflux, iron levels, milk protein allergy, you know, all the things that that can happen. Right. What do you think? So, right. So if we're focusing right now on the research in zero to six months, do you think there's any mm-hmm. clear takeaway at all um, that parents who are listening to this could feel like, oh, okay, that's what I should well, understand about this? Yeah, that's what I should. Yeah. Well, I think what we have to look at is um, how does, you know, the, oh God, self-soothing as this thing, right? right? Like, oh, self-soothing. If you let them cry, they will learn to self-soothe. I mean, we got to kind of start breaking that down because self-soothing means that a child can get activated by something and that they have some skills in order to calm themselves down. Mm -hmm. Under six months, the tool baby's toolbox for that is just itty bitty tiny. Right. Like, like I always tell parents, like, like you and I, if we get really upset, we can call a friend, we can go on a walk, we can do, we can right. watch a movie. We, you know, we got all kinds of skills. A little tiny one can, like you said, can barely get their hand to their mm-hmm. mouth, and that does not even happen if they're crying intensely. Right. There's a a great developmentalist who says, you know, it's okay for children to be frustrated, but if they're really hysterical, they can't access whatever resources they've got Mm -hmm. and they need help. Mm -hmm. So in that first six months, they really have almost nothing to work with. So to say that if they cried and went to sleep, they they self-soothed is a little, is a little not quite Mm -hmm. accurate. Um, self-soothing means you nudge them or you, you test them out and you see what can you do and what can't you do? What do you need help with? And most of the time in that first six months, they need help with everything. Mm -hmm. But the notion that you're somehow laying, this is another thing I hear all the time is like, oh, I know, I know I'm probably giving them bad habits by holding them when they sleep. And you're like, that's not a bad habit. I mean, babies that age can't do habits that you can't somehow fix later on. I mean, developmentally, it's just not even possible. So Hmm. in, well, all the time, we have to know what kids are capable of. We have to know so that we're not, and and I, so that we're not pushing them too far. And I don't think the advice that's out there really gives parents adequate information Mm -hmm. about what are babies capable of at different ages. So I think that that piece that that you always say of like do what works in those first few months. Do mm-hmm. what works because that's so much easier for most people mm-hmm. and I think really resonates with them. Most of the time that's what parents want to do anyway. Yeah. You know, they want to just feed your baby to sleep because the other the alternative is I can't tell you how many people I go, "Yeah, we tried that drowsy but awake and pff, like it doesn't work at all." Right. <laughs> I know, you know, I wish I had used a different phrase or who, I don't even remember who was the first one to use it because it really shouldn't be drowsy, but awake. It should be yeah. calm, but awake, just aware yeah. that yeah. you're being put. Yeah. After your yeah. I say awake, but yeah, I say awake, but ready yeah. for sleep because you're right. The drowsy, but awake, but people are told to do it from mm-hmm. birth, which don't, don't ever put your baby down all the way asleep. I mean, yes, some kiddos can do that, but you know, this is where our temperament conversation will circle back around. 
because babies who have a really thin sensory threshold, the minute you they hit that surface, they're going to be mm-hmm. awake again. And then you got to start all over. Right. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's hard so to. So maybe just saying to parents, um, there are no rules. This we're not talking about like one formula for all children at at any set age. Right. Right. I always say, especially before six months. I mean, you know, I think that the averages or the bell curve is fatter after six months if they're healthy and growing well. But under that, we have to really go baby by baby. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing we have to remember, too, is that parents are just getting their feet Mm -hmm. under them to Mm -hmm. be parents. I mean, I think that, you know, you say start sleep training at three months, parents are just barely getting their bearings on being a parent and on who this baby is and who Mm -hmm. they are. And I mean, I always just say there's time to find out, like just have a perspective of inquiry around your kid and almost experimentation, right? Okay. I'm going to put you down 99.5% asleep and I'm going to see if you can go 0.5% of the way on your own. Yes. No. Okay, cool. You know, start inquiring, but don't, don't, don't feel Mm -hmm. pressured. I think the information really puts pressure on parents to achieve a certain goal. And that's just, I think that's unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there has been any research that shows, like I said, that there are some habits that occur early on that mm-hmm. can't be shifted later. And in fact, yeah. the research on sleep problems really only says there's about 20% of babies have mm-hmm. sleep problems. And so we're recommending sleep training for 100% mm-hmm. of babies when really only 20, 20% of them will ultimately have a problem. Mm. So your baby may not even have a problem. <laughs> I'm right. right. One of those well, ones. that's what we can all wish for, right? <laughs> that we have one of those. <laughs> I, wasn't I wasn't one either. of those. <laughs> I was <laughs> Well, my first one, I guess, was a little easier than my second one. But boy, I, I must have looked yeah. up the definition of colic a hundred times. Um, cause that's a whole other discussion, um, colic in general. I was just thinking, discussion. Oh, how about yeah. all the discussions about cortisol levels and crying and brain yeah. damage and, and the parents are better, but the child's still worse or help us understand that research yeah. that just makes us feel bad. Yeah. Well, cortisol is rough. I mean, it's a rough marker mm-hmm. anyway, because there can be, um, what they call, I think it's like discontinuity, it's not discontinuity, there's a term, meaning that they're, they've are they assessed cortisol when babies get mm-hmm. shots, which is just understandably mm-hmm. stressful. There are some babies who cry mm-hmm. a ton and don't have a cortisol spike, mm-hmm. and other babies who don't cry and have a big mm-hmm. cortisol spike. Cortisol can go in different mm-hmm. directions, so it's not a great marker. Um, so there's been some research that showed and, and there have been animal studies on this too, that, that, you know, under extinction situations, some babies will stop crying, but their cortisol will still be high. That that's, there's some animal studies that show that too. So it's possible. There was another study that showed. Meaning um, that, so, that but, so does happen. that mean as a parent that, oh, my, my baby stopped crying. I'm like, whew, relief. But really, internally, yeah. they're still in a stress state. I think that that study showed mm-hmm. that. There's been other studies, or a, one other study that found something different or critiqued it. I cortisol is just rough because you can't. It takes 20 minutes for it to show up in mm-hmm. the blood, and like I said, there's this sort of discontinuity. So it's a little bit of a squirrely thing mm-hmm. to measure as a as a perfect marker of stress. When they talk about cortisol or when people are worried that crying it out will damage um, attachment, here's what we have to know. Attachment is a huge, big construct that's developed as a result of a Mm -hmm. pattern of responsiveness. It's not one event. I don't think there can be one discrete event that sidetracks um, Mm -hmm. attachment. Attachment might impact smaller things or different pieces, or for some babies might be difficult or in, in a family where there's other stress, who knows? It's a much more complex topic. Um, 
but cortisol and attachment come from a pa- temperament plus a pattern of behavior on the parent's okay. part. Um, I don't think doing crying it out is going to derail attachment. I just, I mean, nobody's really done that research, but I just don't think that's true. Um, so parents can, because I'm always worried about parents listening or reading who go, oh, I did crying it out. Right. Is that horrible? No, it's not horrible. Don't. Well, don't, and you we're probably don't, also if, if don't have ready. a lot of people who've done cried out for like four weeks. You know, I mean, I think yeah, that can it's affect, degree, and then yeah. you just have to wonder, like, why is a child crying yeah. that much? Maybe there's something else going on yeah. besides yeah, a yeah, behavioral yeah. sleep problem, you know? Right, mm-hmm. right, right. And I also think, and I wish we could do this research, I also think crying in the presence of a parent is completely mm-hmm. different than crying in a room by themselves. Um, I always tell parents that. I think biochemically it's way different yeah. because you're standing right there. So they're not afraid. They're not abandoned. They're, you're right, right there. So then what are they crying about? They just don't understand what's happening, that you're changing a pattern that they don't understand. Um, it would be interesting to do that research. But again, it's hard because they'd have to be crying for a bit to even assess cortisol. Um, so yeah, I think that's So a how do you think the call... I know this is like the cli- the kind of cliche question to ask at the end of a podcast, but what do you think are, <laughs> you know, a couple of takeaways that parents, because, you know, one thing I'm hearing is it's all pretty vague and we actually don't have any clear cut yeah. answers. And so then there's a parent sitting there and saying, so what, what, what should I do? Or what now can what? I do? And at what point, right. or what is the takeaway? Right, right, right. Uh, Yeah, the takeaway, I think, like you say, I think if you can wait till six months where stuff settles down, babies have more regulatory Mm -hmm. skills, but also if stuff is working at six months, then change it when you feel it needs to be changed. There's no, there's no, there's no rule that says you have to do it Mm -hmm. at a certain time. Also, there are options, obviously, for sleep training. Pick something you know 100% you can do and that resonates with you and do that like a big dog just really do it um so like you talk about um only work on bedtime if that's all you can do you know go slower if you have to but but go ahead and change those patterns you do not have to you know you don't have to feel pressured to do something that doesn't resonate Mm -hmm. with you i think Mm -hmm. is the key um don't don't feel if you read a book and it it doesn't resonate with you toss that book just toss it it's not it these things they say they they make it sound like they're based in science but science the way people can interpret science is fallible i mean it's fallible so it's and it's part of how people part of their opinion on yeah. something so yeah follow your gut yeah. follow your and gut. there really and, aren't um, 30 and, different sleep training methods no i kind of say it's you know <laughs> the secret of the industry it's all one thing (laughs) it's it's changing Mm -hmm. patterns right and I think people think they have to do it in in one way and I think that that's why um your approach is Mm -hmm. so magical is that you can go slower and if it's tolerable for you you can (laughs) hang in there and you can be supportive Mm -hmm. and you can calm your child down when they're upset like there's no benefit to a kid getting hysterical Yeah. It just isn't. So it's okay. You know, they, all those, that advice that says, okay, you can go in, but don't pick right. that baby up. It's like, right. why not? It goes against our instincts. Like, yeah. So I have a little analogy I use. I'm like, you know, we don't use this idea anywhere else in child rearing. Like never again after sleep training, we don't ever say, Hey kiddo, I, I'm not going to dress you because if I dress you, you will never learn. Or we don't t- give a kid a bike and go, okay, I'm going to be over here. Mm-hmm. Good luck with that. Right. We right. hold on. We, and then we kind of let go. Then we hold on again. And then we, you know, we, we scaffold their skills. And I think if we could get to the place where we're doing that for sleep, I think parents would be a lot happier. I think it would be easier. I, I mean, I think that's what yeah. your approach does it scaffolds their skills. Like, okay, I'm going to be here to help you. And then I'm going to back up. But if you get really upset, I'm right Mm -hmm. here. I'll calm you down. 
because I'm, you know, I don't want you to get hysterical. I'm going to hold on to your little bike until you figure it out. I hope that all the parents that are listening to this feel relieved. Um, Our hope is not to make you feel like you're out dangling in the wind now and not sure what to do. I think it's about like listening to your heart and figuring out what's going to work for you as a family and your baby and know that the research doesn't sound like it's like hard and fast, is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. yeah. Don't feel pressured. Yeah. That's a great mm-hmm. takeaway. I think okay. that's absolutely true. Thank you, McCall. Um, can't wait to have you back uh, also okay. for temperament. So look forward to that episode yeah. too. And if you want to learn yeah. all about uh, McCall Gordon and her website and so sort of follow her on social media, go to sleeplady.com forward slash podcast. And we'll have all the links um, all about McCall and how to read and learn more from her. So thanks again, McCall. Great. Bye. Thank you.